this is really about trying to serve kids better. If we're not serving kids better, what are we doing? Opening more schools. Mm. So there was a, a pivot to a, to a to a great extent to much more of a focus on quality. Hi, I'm Trisha Jal. I am a research fellow in the education program here at the Center for Independent Studies. And today I'm joined by Mackie Raymond, who is the director of Credo, the Centre for Research and Education Outcomes based at Stanford University. Hello, Mackie, and thank you for joining us. Well, oh, thank you so much for having me. Well, I know that one of the big Credo projects has been about charter schools, and I know you've been there for quite a while looking at charter schools, but I'm actually interested to know how you came to uh, be looking at charter schools. So if you tell us, like, let's wind the clock back a little bit. How did you end up um, in your, in your, I guess, how did you develop professionally in order to end up to where you are now? Sure. So I'm a political scientist by training. Yeah. And I have always been interested in the way that government institutions react around monopoly industries. I've been interested in the development of competitive markets uh, throughout my academic and professional career and started looking at healthcare and eventually migrated through a variety of other industries including telecommunications where there was a monopoly and through a variety of mechanisms competition was introduced either because of innovations of technology or because of fiat and you see the development of a competitive marketplace happening and you can track what kinds of benefits end up developing out of that. So I've been very interested in that for, for many, many years. I thought when I first started looking at education that this was a perfect example of an established monopoly, one that had actually been protected by government institutions and by regulation, that would be ripe for competitive development and started to see charter schools as one of the possible vehicles for making that happen. We'd had private schools in the United States, as you have here in Australia, for a long time, and that did not actually seem to make any difference in terms of moving the needle, in terms of how public schools responded. But charter schools are a different kind of public school, and I thought, okay, fine, now we actually have head-to-head -head competition in the same communities with public schools uh, addressing each other competitively. And I thought that would be a really good thing to study. Well, that's fascinating because I know that the, the education landscape for, is different in many respects, but one of them is, I guess, the, is, is the, the non-government school sector, whereas in, in the US, the, almost, the, a private school is a properly private school. In Australia, the vast majority of non-government schools get some amount of funding, and that's to promote school choice, this idea that you can actually choose to where you, where you send your children to school. And that's got its roots in like a whole bunch of complicated history, but it relates to, you know, for instance, um, this being kind of like a, like a, a religious kind of freedom thing. So Catholic schools wanting to provide um, education to Catholic students that was in line with their sort of faith tradition and that over time became something that was supported by governments financially. So it's, that I think is something that's really different about our context. But you're talking about charter schools, which are not private schools for reasons we've already discussed, but they're not traditional public schools either. Can you tell us a little bit about what makes a charter school different from a traditional public school or a, or a district school? Sure, so in the United States, uh, the way that most schools are organized, there is a local education agency, a school district, and that central, um, organization is governed by a locally elected school board and they oversee some number of individual schools across a community. That entire entity is, is organized hierarchically. Charter schools operate outside of that kind of arrangement. They are granted essentially a, a contract to operate as a public school, publicly funded, but they are given particular privileges uh, in exchange for a term contract that includes a pretty structured and supposedly significant review of their performance at the end of the contract. And so in, in the contract, they are given a lot of discretion to choose the kind of school that they want to organize, whether that's programmatic, whether that's got a particular theme, how they staff it, what kinds of hours they keep, whether it's all in a building or whether they're out in the community at all, they get this kind of discretion um, in exchange for 
the expectation that their performance will be reviewed rigorously at the end of their term. That's completely a separate mechanism than what happens in the traditional school district or local education agency organization of schools in the United States. So, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, like a district, it obviously would, there's so many districts in the United States that different districts will have different levels of, I guess, requirements, but you know, it might look like some of the requirements on traditional public schools might look like class sizes, um, maximum class sizes, or a requirement that teachers have been trained to a particular standard or a, or a particular way, um, or like I guess like the length of the school day, the length of the school year, but you're saying that, tradi that charter schools are not bound by any of these sorts of requirements. So they're not, these aren't kind of minimum requirements going in, but in exchange, they are real, they're held to, I guess, outcomes. So they're expected to, as a condition of their charter, their, their, the accountability rests on that other side. It's not we're going to, I guess, regulate the, the input side. We're actually going to be regulating or looking at having the accountability on the output side. So we're actually going to be looking at school, the student outcomes as part of that process of accountability. That's exactly right. There's an independent organization known as an authorizer who has the oversight authority over charter schools. And that authorizer has the responsibility of clearing applicants who wish to open schools to make sure that there are, of course, some minimum standards. You have to have a curriculum and you have to have an understanding about how you're going to staff the place. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a, a clear idea of what you know, sort of your safety and health regulations look like. Mm. Uh, but after that, um, your, your choice in terms of how you staff it, whether you are able to, uh, whether you want to use teachers that have had experience in district settings or whether you want to specifically have experience, non-experienced teachers. Um, there are a number of charter schools that actually prefer to hire what they call green teachers mm. um, that have not been particularly trained, but train them in their own, essentially, development program uh, that includes their own way of preparing teachers for the classroom. So that's great as long as, at the end of that time, what they've done for students actually measures up. And of course, there are some financial and some governance issues that also are evaluated at the end of that term. Oh, fantastic. That's really interesting because um, it really suggests that there's so much that can be studied there. I mean, I know that your work in particular is very sort of high level, but you could really look at some of the di the differences that I guess in the details of the decisions that, that charter schools make around, you know, something like teacher professional development and potentially compare that to, to traditional public schools to try and get an understanding of, um, of I guess what what might have been the causal imp impacts of, of the outcomes, like what have actually what has actually driven the different outcomes, if indeed there are. Um, I want to go back a little bit in terms of charter schools, as a, in terms of their history. Like, how did they come about? What was the kind of policy context in which they emerged? Well, they came out of um, a, a conversation that had been occurring in the United States about the need to improve schools. Um, in 1983, actually 40 years ago, um, a report was published uh, by a national commission. The report was called A Nation at Risk. And the pivotal line in that was, if a foreign government had done to us what we have done to our schools, we would have considered it an act of war. Amazing. And so that was pretty much a, a clarion call to, our schools are not doing well 40 years ago. <laughs> we need to take action. and. One of the um, reactions to that report was a discussion from uh, a number of educators suggesting that educators themselves might want to think differently about creating a school. The motivation for the original charter schools was not to break away and provide competitive pressure to district schools. It was actually motivated by an interest of teachers to create a school environment that they felt was more conducive to allowing them to bring forward their best talents. They didn't feel that the school system that they were facing was supportive of their full set of gifts. And so the, the very early charter schools were essentially teacher commune communal things. Um, they evolved very quickly to have a variety of emphases. And the largest slice of charter schools now 
um, are, are actually much more focused on equity and social justice and serving communities that have been traditionally underserved by the local school district systems. And their models are intentionally uh, focused on serving, going into communities and serving populations that traditionally have been difficult to serve or have not been served well in the past. So we'll get into, I guess, some of the, the work that Credo has done and that you've led at Credo in a moment. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, unpacking a little bit more of those differences. So we've talked about what distinguishes them from a, in terms of the freedoms that charter schools have um, relative to a traditional public school. They've also got that accountability on the other end. But I mean, a non-government school in Australia, as I assume is a private school in the US, can obviously choose their students. Can charter schools choose the students that enter their doors? Like, could you could you argue that they're just um, that they are able to be selective, and that's why they might have distinct outcomes from the rest of their district comparisons? Well, certainly that's an allegation that's been placed and charged against charter schools. But in fact, by law, they have to have open enrollment. They are not allowed to select their students um, initially, and. Uh, if there are more students than they have seats available for, they must select their students by a random lottery. Um, we've actually done some work and have found that the charge of, of served someplace else, but as an, as an element of school choice, you might argue that that was um, a, a regular part of the, the school choice bargain is to help families find the schools where their children's are, children are successful. Great, okay, so let's dive in now to Credo's work. So you've done three studies looking at charter schools. So when did you start and what, what were some of the early findings comparing charter school performance with district schools? So I want to make the distinction that we've done three national studies. We've actually three done over a hundred charter studies in various combinations of either localities or time periods or clusters of schools. Um, the three national studies, we started this work actually in 2006 and our first study was published in 2009 and covered 16 states uh, that offered charter schooling. I should mention that charter schools are only empowered by state law and so across the 50 states plus the District of Columbia uh, we have 44 states that allow charter schools plus the District of Columbia for, for a total of 45. Uh, and we found in our first study that charter schools did not do as well educating their students as their students would have been able to be educated had they gone to their other local district schools. Mm. Uh, and that was quite a shock because uh, there was very much a mythology, if you will, um, a, a sort of a common shared narrative at that time that charter schools were uh, were providing an excellent education simply by the fact that they existed they were obviously superior and the data didn't support that and you've done some obviously more national studies since you've just released the third one a few months ago how has that changed well I, I'd still like to go back to the 2009 because I want to talk about yeah I want to talk about the the sort of the shock and awe of that study. Um, I think it's fair to say that the charter school community was unprepared and very surprised by the results that we published when we brought that study forward. Um, and uh, aside from the initial agitation, um, I give actually the leaders of the charter school communities a lot of credit because there was a lot of soul searching that went on. Mm. And really there was a very important pivot at that time that they uh, engineered away from a quantity focus of just let's get as many schools open as we possibly can, let's flood the market if you will, to wait a second, this is really about trying to serve kids better. If we're not serving kids better, what are we doing? Opening more schools. Mm. So there was a, a pivot to a, to, a, to a great extent to much more of a focus on quality. I share that because the next time we did a study, which was in uh, 2013, uh, so the subsequent sort of five years of data, uh, we found that there was improvement, but only a modest amount. 
and what they were doing at that point was sort of pulling even with district schools. Uh, that did show improvement and that was great, but uh, we found in that study that mostly the improvement in quality had to do with authorizers and accountability starting to take care of the bottom schools and the schools themselves were not changing their quality very much, but by cutting off the left side of the distribution, you could move the distribution yeah, forward. Of course. So that was the story in 2013. In 2023, the story changes a lot. And I, I want to say in that period from the first study to the third study, we added um, to our study about 3,000 schools. Uh, so that indicates the sort of the dynamics of how quickly the sector has been growing over this time. We added 3,000 schools to our study and still found that uh, the typical student enrolled in a charter school was getting a much stronger education by attending a charter school than they would have had in their regular district schools. Much more importantly, the difference between the 2009 results and the 2023 results showed that the sector was getting better and it wasn't because authorizers were closing down bad schools. They were still doing some of that. But with the addition of 3,000 new schools, what we saw was the schools themselves were getting better individually over time and that schools had moved to a sort of continuous improvement model that you could see in their year-to-year -year performance, even though their students were still difficult populations to serve, that they were finding better ways to be more effective over time. And of course, like bearing in mind what you, what you mentioned earlier about the fact that in many cases, charter schools, the schools themselves will serve um, the most disadvantaged among the, the districts in which they serve. That's a really tremendous uh, finding, especially uh, about the fact that um, it's that you there was that continuous improvement, and I'm interested to know because um, obviously the, the role of the authorizer is really critical in this. Is what's driving that? Is it is it the accountability on that at the end of the? And, and I appreciate this maybe isn't quite what is being studied in those studies, but any other kind of I guess insight that you have? Like, mm -hmm. do you think it's the auth Is it the accountability at the other end that's forcing improvement through the system? Is it the um, is it the ability of, um, is it the ability of, I guess, high performing charter schools to start networks that, that kind of operate uh, across multiple schools? Like, what do you think is being, is driving that? Because that's a, you, you, you've said, I mean, 3,000 schools being added, it's clearly not just, a, you know, being able to maintain and improve outcomes while also growing right. is tremendous. So, um, you, you've touched on a couple of things that are really important. Um, we have not yet mentioned that charter schools have an additional dimension to them, which is that some charter schools open up and they wish to stay a single school, a standalone charter, they're happy doing what they're doing. Others really have an aspiration of taking a successful model and replicating it so that they can serve more students. Mm. And those schools grow into networks if they're high performing and they're given permission to grow. Uh, what we're seeing is that uh, the schools that are being approved for replication are getting stronger over time themselves, their own improvement strategies, but then they're also able to replicate strong schools. So not only are they, uh, they are finding strong practices themselves, but they're also able now to demonstrate that they can scale those strong practices. That's a huge positive benefit for the field in general because scaling of positive interventions in education policy, oh, as you yeah. well know, is a pretty rare beast. Uh, on the authorizer side, there has been a real strong focus. There have been sort of generations of standards of authorizing that the authorizer community has um, developed and adopted. Not all authorizers are operating at the same level of quality, but you can see the general tendency is to get in is getting stronger. And where we see in our data 
we can identify states where that authorizer practice has in fact moved forward a great deal. We can see those are the states that have the highest rates of improvement over time in their schools. So not only is it schools getting better, but they are in fact responding to the higher standards that are, uh, the authorizers are setting in the accountability side of the equation. I've got a couple more questions. Um, one of them is the fact that you mentioned earlier that I guess that there was a shift in, in the emphasis of charter schools from being, I guess, that the, that place for, for teachers to kind of bring their best selves to a bit more of a social justice orientation. And, you, and we've talked about the, the fact that the demographics that charter schools serve are not only not selecting the most advantaged students, they actually... Um, serving you know, the others. Yeah, serving, serving our, the most disadvantaged students. Um, in your research, you uncovered some schools that were doing quite well in trying to, I guess, reduce some of the achievement gaps, which obviously plague, plague the United States as they plague, you know, Australia. You know, the more rural you are in Australia, the worse educa your education outcomes compared to someone in the major city. Um, same thing if you've got parents of low education um, or low income. Um, First Nations, Indigenous students as well tend to do more poorly than, than non-Indigenous students. So we've kind of got those, a similar concern around social justice and equity and wanting to make sure that we produce a school system that works for all students. But you found some schools that are doing pretty well at trying to work on that problem. Yeah, so give me a moment to set the table on this yeah. because um, the finding is actually pretty amazing, but I want to put it into a, a larger context. When we look at charter school performance, we want to know, are they serving all students well? And by looking at what happens to different groups of students within the schools, um, we're able to compare, for example, do Hispanic students who are attending charter schools get a better education than Hispanic students who look like them that were going to district schools, and so forth for other kinds of school uh, student groups. What we found is that uh, in general, charter schools are serving black and Hispanic students and students in poverty better than they would have been educated in district schools. That's a great finding. But what we found in addition to that was even though it was better, it was still not as good in general across the population of charter schools as would be for white students or for students who were not in poverty. So there were still achievement gaps even though they were superior, they were smaller gaps than the district schools were creating. But then we looked more deeply at the schools that were successful, and we ended up finding this group of schools that we labeled gap busting that uh, have the characteristic that they are growing their students' learning as, as in the top half of the state. So they're better than the state average in how much students progress from year to year across all the students in the school, and the learning of their minority students is on par with white students, and their poverty student learning is on par with their non-poverty peers in the same school. So what we're finding is no achievement gap in learning, no gap in learning year to year, Amazing. which means achievement gaps don't create, don't get created, or if there are gaps, they're not exacerbated over time. That's, that's really incredible. We found thousands of schools that do this. And so for me, the prime takeaway of this isn't, hey, rah, rah, charter schools. It's, guys, we have the evidence that this kind of education is possible, and it sort of sets the new quality standard for conversation across the country, because if you know that it's possible to create those kinds of outcomes for kids, so that all students get the same progress and the same access to opportunity eventually, then how could communities tolerate anything else? That's a really important point, I think, um, because you're right, it, it sort of sets a new conversation. It really shows that it can be possible. And I guess it's, it's really important as well because we're sort of looking at it in terms of obviously at a very high level, but that, you know, in terms of the, the potential for those kids that are receiving that education, that means you know, amazing things for those individual students that are there. So that's something that I feel like you know, in policy, sometimes we, we get so focused on, on the big picture that we forget about the fact that you know, we're not just talking about, you know, oh, this, you know, this group of students are statistically this much more likely to be behind their peers. 
that actually represents a child and it represents someone who's having their, their life outcomes shaped by factors that are beyond their control. And so it really, I think for me, particularly someone who, who's trained as a teacher, worked in disadvantaged schools, for me, I think it really um, shows that there's actually, we can't be complacent. We can't just sort of say that, oh, you know, it's, it's fine. These kids, these guys are always behind and therefore they're, and the, un, the unspoken part of that sentence is, and therefore they're always going to be behind. It really does show that I think another, another world is, is possible. Well, this is a real strong case where the evidence, uh, there is evidence here that practice is possible. Whether that ends up getting translated into policy mm. in the future remains to be seen. But clearly the biggest contribution that I think we've made is the idea that you can create systems, you can create policy environments where schools actually have the incentive to get better over time. And you've got uh, more than a thousand schools that tell you that they can use that flexibility to create learning environments where no disadvantages start to materialize. So those are two incredible opportunities for the entire education sector in the United States to sit up and take notice and decide how they're going to use that. And it's, it's a tremendous opportunity for researchers as well. You can go find those schools. Let's like, you know, look inside the black box. What are they doing to actually generate those sorts of outcomes? Um, I want to kind of switch back to the big picture cause, and, and kind of loop back to how, where we started this conversation, which is your, your background and I guess competitive markets. And I guess at least part of the conversation around charter schools has been that they represent, I guess, a, a school of choice, that, that, that families and, and students can vote with their feet. And by doing so, they could potentially lift outcomes, not just in that for the for the schools that are being, for the schools and for the students that are in those schools, but potentially by creating a competition effect that it could help um, improve outcomes in traditional public schools. Have you seen any evidence of, of that? So we've only done one study of that, and we found some mixed results. Mm. But there is a, an evolving body of evidence that suggests that uh, there is some competitive pressure. Um, it seems to be pretty mild. Um, the way that the research seems to go, um, as long as the school is distant from you geographically, even by a block or two, it's very easy for teams within schools to ignore the fact that there's a better school down the street. Yeah. Where we find that that actually doesn't hold is when schools are co-located in the same building. And there's a, a wonderful study of uh, some co-located charter schools and district schools in New York City where the competitive effect, if you're not in the same building, is modest but significant. But if you're in the same building and they're right inside, they're, they're, they're eyeball to eyeball <laughs> every single day, the effect is four times greater. So the district schools pick up and move four times as much because the evidence of high perform performance is right there. Okay, well, it's really fascinating insight there, it's particularly around competition, because it kind of makes sense to me that um, if charter schools are held to that really strong kind of uh, pressure from authorizers on the accountability um, at the end of their charter, whereas traditional public schools really aren't held to that standard, that maybe the competition wouldn't necessarily be as strong um, especially if, yeah, because there's, there's no penalty, there's no downside, right, to, to the traditional public schools not rising to the occasion. Um, I guess, to, just to kind of finish off, um, what is the kind of one takeaway from the work that you've been doing in, in charter schools for, I guess, policymakers? Mm -hmm. So for me, the, the largest policy implication here is that Policymakers don't necessarily have to replicate charter schools um, in, in other parts of the world. What I would encourage them to think about, though, is that the framework that charter schools operate under, which is this flexibility, local autonomy, local decision making, the ability to customize their program for the local needs that they're facing of their students, and be able to tweak that at will really adapt as they need to, um, coupled with what I call the credible threat of mm -hmm. accountability, that that combination 
is something that has powerful incentives that schools respond to. The lesson for me for policymakers in the United States and elsewhere is that policy can be a very effective tool if you give it long enough to actually take root and allow for folks to actually respond to it. That's not something we see in the United States. We have very rapid cycle policy cycles. You probably have some of that too, given your electoral patterns. Um, but the fact that we've had 20 years of a policy framework that hasn't changed substantially, you actually can see that it started, it, it took a while to get going and then it takes off. And certainly not all the charter schools are, are strong and positive, but the tendency moves that way and it gets more and more that way the longer it goes on. Well, thank you so much for that conversation. Well, thank you. I, these questions were great. The conversation was terrific.